You see, now I've introduced him a few times um, as I've hosted a meeting and he's been preaching. And I was thinking uh, this morning, I was like, how can I introduce him in a fresh and exciting way? Um, if anyone knows Tim, you'll know how incredibly capable and talented he is. It's incredibly frustrating uh, to be a friend of him. If you don't know Tim, let me give you an example of some of the stuff he's good at. He is an exceptional mathematician. He works as an actuary, which is, I don't quite know, it's maths but a really high level. He plays most of the instruments that you can see on the stage. In fact, every instrument you can see on the stage, he can play. And he also has an amazing singing voice. You know, I spent some time with him recently and another thing that I found about him, which he's exceptionally good at, which really frustrated me, he makes an amazing beef and Stilton pie. <laughs> And it blew my mind. I, I could not believe that he had another string to his bow. Um, but this morning, we've got a passage from Hebrews, which is a, it's, it's a tricky one. And you know what? He is the best person I could imagine to come and share that with us this morning. Because not only that, um, he's a great cook, he's a great musician, he's a great father, husband, all of that kind of stuff. He is an exceptional Bible teacher. And I can't think of anybody else who I would rather walk us through this passage this morning than Tim Chapman. So guys, let's give him another round of applause as he teaches us. Thank you, Matt. Um, and if the bar has been set pretty high in the last two minutes, I promise you within the first 30 seconds of this uh, sermon, you're going to realise why not all things are quite so straightforward in life. When I tell you this story about something that happened to me a few weeks ago, so my um, sons and I and my mum, their grandma, went to Wembley for the first time to watch England playing football. But the thing that I will remember most about this evening, and it's not because the game was bad, but it's what happened on the train ride on the way to the stadium. Let me set some context. It was a Friday afternoon, and we'd planned meticulously the route that we were going to take to get from our house to Wembley Stadium, only to find that that train line was closed. And so we frantically tried to find another way, and the result was we left relatively late on a Friday afternoon, and I hadn't had time to use the bathroom. Now, 60 minutes later, we've been crawling around the M25, going through traffic, and we eventually make it to the station. I think, at last, I need the toilet so much. So I go onto the platform, my mum's looking after the kids, and I see the signs for the gents. So I run down, think, here we go. Oh, at last. All of a sudden, I see a sign, toilets only open between 9 a.m. and midday. I think, I mean, like, I understand why McDonald's doesn't serve breakfast in the afternoon, but, like, toilets, surely they should be open all day, right? Unless there's something relatively fundamental about life that I'm missing. It is like a 7 till 10 activity, increasingly with age, a 24-hour sport. So I, I just couldn't believe that the toilets were shut, but I thought, it's all right, the train's going to be here in 15 minutes. I'm going to pace up and down the station, cross my legs a little bit. And I eventually came to the moment where the train was coming into the station. You know, I've played this game before. I know where the toilets are. It's the, it's the carriage where the, the seats are in a slightly unusual configuration. So we head for those doors, we jump on the train, and by this stage, I'm bursting. So my kids sit down next to me, my mum sat there with them, and I walk past several people, and I make it to a toilet that looks something like this. It's one with one of those big sliding doors that goes really slowly. So I run over, I press the button, kind of open it, slowly opening, right? I step inside, it's still opening. Right, eventually, right, now I need to press the shut button. Oh, at last, I lock the door, and I start to use the facilities. About two seconds later, I hear a noise that scares the living daylights out of me. And I look over my shoulder, and where there used to be the door was a number of passengers going like this. <laughs> and I just didn't know what to do in that situation. I'm thinking, what is the right course of action? Like, I can't reach the buttons. Uh, do I ask someone for help? I was thinking, do I need to shut the door before I flush, before I wash my hands? Like, no one has prepared me for this situation in life. Anyway, eventually, I finish doing what I'm doing, and I go back out to the carriage. And this guy leans over to me, and I'd walked past him, you know, 60 seconds earlier when I was going to the toilet, and he leans over to me and he says, that's why you never use the toilet when the train is at the station. And I thought, well, thanks for telling me now. <laughs> And, and the moral of the story, and maybe you're picking up a few different ones, but the moral for me is that warnings that come too late don't help us at all. Danger, deep water, you need to know before you get into the sea. Stop, extreme heat, you need to know before you go on a walk. Same with 
electricity, and then the sign that was not on the wall at Denham Station, do not use the toilet while the train is standing in the station. Warnings that come too late, warnings that are no good, that aren't clear, don't help us at all. And this morning, we're going to look at two warnings that we find in this letter written to the Hebrews. Um, maybe a warning from me before we start that this talk will be it might feel a little bit different to some of the other talks that we do here on a Sunday morning. It, it might be a bit more serious, a bit heavier than usual. And especially if you're a guest here this morning, if you're just exploring faith, this isn't the kind of talk that we would do every week. Um, and actually, it's probably not the first thing that I'd want to talk to you about if we're having a conversation about Jesus. This, these warnings are addressed to people that are some way through their Christian walk. But the reason we're talking about it is that we think it's really important as we go through the Bible to teach about the passages that we like to hear and that are easy to our ears, but also the ones that are a bit more difficult and that are harder to hear. And so we're going to do that this morning as we go through these two warning passages. Before we go any further, let me ask you a question. What words or images come into your mind when I say the phrase, a loving parent? What comes to your mind? What words do you use, do you think of? These are some of the pictures that came up when I put that term into Google this week. I wonder if you could imagine a, a scene when a child is on a beach and, and the sea is in front of them and the child really, really wants to go in the sea. But the parent is saying to them, you must not go into the sea. Don't even go close. On its own, you might think, well, that is, that's not a loving parent. That's relatively unkind. What, what's going on there? But if then you saw at the same time that there were warning signs that said, danger, current, anyone who goes in the sea will be dragged out, then your perspective would totally change, right? You think, oh, well, of course the parent is saying that. In fact, if the parent wasn't issuing that warning, then we think they weren't a very good parent, weren't loving, weren't caring. And there may be moments this morning when we read the words in the Bible together and they surprise us or they challenge the way that we think about God. And we might be thinking a little bit like the child at the beach. Why? Why would they not let me go in the sea? You know, why is God saying that? I don't really understand. What if when it comes to some of these big questions about God and life and mercy and justice, there are some things that like that little child we can't fully appreciate yet? So I want you to keep that in mind as we read these through. And I want to encourage you this morning that if when reading the Bible, you think, oh, I didn't think about that or that challenges or that changes the way that I think about God a little bit, then that is the really, really good place to be. That's a really good place to be because it means the God that we pray to, the God that we sing to, the God that we serve is not God as we would wish him to be. He's not in any way kind of a figment of our imagination, but he's God as he's revealed himself in the scriptures to us. So with some trepidation about reading these passages, I'm also really pleased for us that we're going to hear the words of God this morning. So there are five main warnings in the book of Hebrews, and today we're just going to focus on two of them. Um, and then we're going to read briefly from chapter 12, where the author brings together lots of what has been said so far. Okay, without further ado, and with having had a relatively long introduction, let's read from Hebrews chapter 6. If you're Following your Bibles, please feel free to turn there. We're going to start in verse 4. And as we go through these warnings, I want you to think of these questions that we're going to ask. Who is this warning written to? What is being warned against? And what is the consequence of not listening to the warning? Now, as ever, the context is important, right? So for those of you that haven't been with us, the, he the letter to the Hebrews is written to a group of Jewish Christians, so those that grew up in the Jewish faith but have come to believe that in Jesus Christ, all those promises of the Old Testament for a coming Messiah to rescue the people of God, to remake the world, they have all been fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So they were Jewish Christians, but in face of some oppression, social exclusion, persecution, they're now starting to drift away. They're thinking, mm, I'm not really sure about this. And so the author writes these words. He says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. 
So let's briefly answer those questions. Who is the warning written to? Verse 4 to 6 tells us it's those that have been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, who've in some way experienced God, they've shared in him, they know some of the goodness of being part of the Christian community, but question two, are now being warned against falling away, changing their minds, having one day following Jesus and then drifting away from that commitment. And the warning, question three, is this. It is impossible for those who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To put it another way, the author is saying it is possible to go so far on a journey of faith in Jesus Christ and then to fall away in such a way that makes it impossible to come back again. Like many of you, uh, my family is a mix of different nationalities and my family is primarily English and Welsh. And that meant that there was a time when I was seven, eight, nine years old, when I could have turned out to be an English rugby fan, or I could have become a Welsh rugby fan. Now, there was a moment I could have chosen to celebrate the men in red. I could have celebrated the brilliant rugby that was played on the grounds of the Millennium Stadium. Shane Williams, Gareth Edwards, they could have been my heroes. I could have been singing in the valleys with them. And friends, let me tell you, I experienced some of that. Christmas 1998, I was there at the Knoll with my nana, cheering the Welsh All Blacks play. I knew what it was like to be part of the Welsh rugby community. <laughs> thank you, thank you, yeah, thank you. Yeah. But as it was, I chose a different way. I chose the dark side. I chose the English rugby team. I chose the joy of Johnny Wilkinson's drop goal. I chose the pain of World Cup final losses. But as I regularly say to my nana, you have to be there to lose, right? Things could have been different. And I think it's fair to say it would now be impossible for me to go back. I, do, I honestly don't think, however hard I tried, that I could rock up to Twickenham Stadium, pull on a red shirt, and genuinely deep down inside be pleased when Wales cross over the line and score a try. Or not when England score in the corner, give a little... It's impossible. I've gone so far on this journey, I don't think I can go back. And the author says something similar. To be brought about to repentance literally means to change your mind or to change direction. And he says that there reaches a point after having formed away when that is simply no longer possible. It's impossible to recognise the situation in which we find ourselves and to deep down generally in our hearts say, actually, I'm going to choose Jesus instead. And the warning is bleak and it is clear. The good news is this, though. If you are here today, or you're listening online, and your heart is beating and your mind is racing, and you're thinking, oh, Lord Jesus, please let that not be me, then that day hasn't yet come. Repentance is possible. Changing your mind is possible. But do it. Listen to these warnings. Do it today, because there comes a point of no return, and we don't know when that point will be. The second warning comes from Hebrews chapter 10. And um, again, if you want to turn there, we're going to be from verse 26. And this is the section of the letter that Dave spoke about a few weeks ago when he spoke about Jesus' death and his resurrection. And we don't have time to cover all of this, but what Dave explained um, was that through his death, Jesus made a sacrifice on our behalf. That's the phrase that the, the letter uses. And because that sacrifice is in place, because Jesus died in our place, it means that God sees us through that lens and we can confidently come before him. We can pray and we can worship. It means as well that that day when we meet Jesus will be a good day for those who have placed their trust in God. That is something to be looked forward to, something to be celebrated. And it's why the author says things like this, these famous words from Hebrews chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. You may well have heard those verses. They're read regularly in church. A sacrifice for sin is in place, which means that we can come before our God and our maker. The verses that follow say this. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment 
and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is probably the most difficult passage, and I've, I warned you at the start, these are hard words to hear at times. This might be one of those moments where the temptation is to think, well, I know what God is like, so this must mean something, that, something else, or to try and explain it away, or even to maybe feel the offence of it. But I just want to encourage you just to sit with these words for a moment. Let's answer these questions. Listen to the words of God. So who receives the warning? Verse 19 tells us that it's brothers and sisters, you know, those that are part of the family of God. Verse 26 tells us it's those that have received knowledge of the truth. Verse 30 even uses the word sanctified. It's those that have been set apart or made holy. Similar groups of those in chapter 6. Second question, what is being warned against? It's ongoing and deliberate sin. And that's the word that the Bible uses to describe kind of missing the mark of understanding the life that Jesus calls us to, knowing what the right thing to do is by him and by those around us, and choosing to do something else. Now, the rest of this section makes it clear how serious what's being described here is. So keep in mind that the context here is a group of people who are on the verge of walking away from their faith entirely. And think about some of the words that the author uses to describe the actions. It talks about trampling the Son of God underfoot, kind of understanding that Jesus came to lay down his life for us, and instead of committing to him, trampling on him instead. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where you are pleading with someone to change their mind about something, to not do the thing that they plan to do. Maybe it's, please, please don't leave this marriage, or please, please don't join that gang, or don't commit this crime, or don't hide this crime. And you're begging them and you're saying, have you thought about the consequences of what you're going to do? Have you thought about what might happen? Have you thought about the rights and wrongs of it? Have you thought of the impact on your kids or your family or your marriage or your freedom? Do you not understand what you are doing? And someone looks back and they're like, you know what? I get all of that. I understand it, but I want to do it anyway. I wonder if you've ever had a moment where you talk about someone who at one point professed faith in Jesus, who understands the Christian faith, who understands what that life looks like, but says, you know what? I just don't care anymore. I understand that Jesus calls me to do this, but I want to do that, and I'm going to do it. I think that's something of what is being described here. Ongoing, persistent rejection of Jesus and the life that he calls us to. And question three, what will happen if the warnings aren't listened to? The author describes this fearful expectation of judgment. He says, no sacrifice for sin is left. He says, the work that Jesus did, the merciful work that he did on our behalf has been discarded. And then rather than one day approaching God with confidence and with joy, it becomes a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To face that day alone when we stand before him and give an account for everything we've done and thought or said or not done, not thought, not said, and not be able to say, I get it, I got, I went wrong, but I trusted in Jesus. And instead to have to try and explain why we took the action we did. He says, that's a dreadful thing. That's a terrible situation in which to find yourself. So please, he's warning us, don't find yourself there. This... Um, this summer, I went on a walk with my kids, and we were going along the top of a cliff in Cornwall, and it was one of those walks where if the clouds hadn't been there and the rain hadn't been falling down, you'd have had beautiful views across the sea, but as it was, you could just about see the sand on the floor and then some clouds in front of you. 
Um, but it was one of those walks where, like, a little bit if I was walking off this stage, you could keep walking towards the edge of the cliff, and there would then come a point when you would fall and you would just go straight into the sea or straight onto the beach. There wasn't like a slow um, hill that you could maybe grab onto something. When, it, when you fell, it would have been too late. And I don't know if this is just my kids, but they seem to want to play the game. How close can we walk to the cliff before either daddy screams at us or daddy has a heart attack or something happens? Um, and I'm thinking, but I was a parent and I'm thinking, no, 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 please, please, guys, stay well away from the edge. Come and walk on the path. And I think we can sometimes read a passage like we just read in Hebrews and think a little bit like our children, as in, oh, I understand that there is a line that I cannot cross. I understand I've, t I've heard this warning and I'm doing some things and I'm wondering, oh, could it be over the line? I don't really know, but I'm going to see how close I can get. Whereas as a parent in that situation, you're saying, no, 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 stay as far away from the edge as you can possibly go. Walk as closely to the path as you can possibly walk, because you will go one way, and then you could go another way, and then, you could, and then it would be too late. Oh, you could live like this, I could do like this, I could keep doing those things one more time, one more time, one more look, one more time, and then it's too late. And so the author is warning us, don't do it. Refuse, walk as far away as possible, because there will come a point when no sacrifice for sins remains. Again, as with chapter six, the warning is clear, but the promise is that if you are hearing this and can respond to it today, then praise God, you've not reached that point. But again, hear the warning, heed them today, listen to him, because we don't know when that point will come. The author then brings together these warnings, and so many of the themes, actually, that we've heard throughout this letter in chapter 12, with some famous words that you will have heard before. He is pleading with this church. He's warned them, he's encouraged them, he's pointed them to Jesus and told them how much great he is. He's pointed them, he's reminded them of those that have gone before, the great faith fathers, faith mothers that Matt spoke about last week. He's reminded us about Jesus, and then he encourages them. He says, therefore, throw off everything that hinders. He says, throw off that sin that so easily entangles. You know, stay well away from that path. Go nowhere close to the edge, but instead run. Run with perseverance, this race marked out before you. And he says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the perfecter and the pioneer of your faith. And I think he understands how hard this is because of the things he says next. And we sometimes give the Hebrews a bit of a bad rap. They are being persecuted. They are being excluded. This is a really difficult situation in which they find themselves. The author gets that, but he's asking them to keep going anyway. He says, I know that it's hard. I know that it might be easier to step off and to go in a different direction. It may be more convenient. There might be things that you have to do because of your faith in Jesus that are so inconvenient. But it would just be so much easier if... There might be things that you really, really want to do deep down that you have to say, actually, I'm going to follow Jesus, so I'm going to say no to that. Or things that you really don't want to do that, that Jesus would ask you to do. The author gets how hard it would be, but he says, keep going, keep running this race and fix your eyes on Jesus, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, who scorned its shame. He says, consider him who um, faced such opposition from sinners, so that you may not grow weary, that you may not lose heart. Please, he's saying, respond to these warnings. Follow the example of those that have gone before us. Keep going, keep running this race for the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul writes to Timothy later on, keep fighting the fight, keep running the race. Look forward to that day when the Lord Jesus returns, long for his appearing. Be part of those that cannot wait to see him, rather than wondering if it will be a dreadful thing when you meet him. We're nearly done. I wonder if the band could start preparing to come back up. Before we finish, though, there's one more question that I want us to answer. And it's a question that some of you might have been asking as we've been going through this morning. And that's this. What does these passages, what do the warnings mean about Christian salvation? In particular, is it the case that once you're saved, you're always saved? Or is it possible that you can be following Jesus and then one day decide not to? And there's a number of views on this that um, Christians in history have reached. And the first one, um, largely informed by these warnings that we've read today, is that this, the, the warnings are that Christians can fall away. 
and hopefully it's clear having read those passages why people would reach that conclusion. You know, that it's possible to one day be following Jesus and then to not. But before we land there, I think it's important that we read a few other verses because the Bible speaks about this topic at different times with slightly different emphases. So, for example, even within this letter, straight after that warning in chapter six, the author says, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, things that have to do with salvation. The early Christian leader Paul speaks confidently about the he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe the clearest expression of this certainty um, that, that's expressed that once someone follows Jesus, they will not fall away comes from Jesus himself. He speaks to people in John chapter 10 and he says this, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. And then he repeats himself, which means you've got to listen to Jesus at that point. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. See, for Jesus, the question doesn't seem to be, can a Christian lose their salvation? For Jesus, the question seems to be this, can Jesus lose a Christian? And his answer is no, emphatically no. You are my sheep, you will follow me. No one will snatch you out of my hand. My father is greater than all. No one can take you away. No one can snatch you out of my hand. You have been born again. You cannot be unborn. You've been brought into my family. You cannot be thrown away. And so a second view of these warning passages is that maybe they aren't addressed to Christians. Maybe those that are being spoken about, those that have experienced something of the goodness of God, that have tasted of a measure of that, are those that are well on their way towards faith, but have not yet quite committed. And, and that could be what they mean. But there is a third view that tries to hold together these two seemingly contradictory ideas that on the one hand, as you read through these warnings, they seem addressed to Christians, you know, those that have been sanctified, brothers and sisters, experienced the knowledge of the truth. But on the other hand, that Jesus and Paul and other pastors regularly throughout the New Testament speak with confidence that Jesus will finish what he started in the life of a Christian. And we'll talk about this in a moment, but the idea is essentially that these warnings will work. Let's speak just for a moment about um, two contradictory ideas and how we might hold them together. So some of you will remember this blue or gold dress. And this went around the internet for ages, right? Is it this or is it this? It can't be both, but then depending on how you looked at it, that seemed to be the case. Some of you might have studied Romeo and Juliet and been asked that question in English, like who killed Juliet? And you're thinking, oh, well, is it Juliet? Or was it her family? Or was it Shakespeare that killed Juliet? And you're like, well, Yes, it is, it is all of those things. Some of you might have listened in science lessons and hopefully I'll get some brownie points from Julia here. But, but how about light? Is light a wave? Because sometimes it very much looks like it is as it's going through, it's refracting, it's all doing kinds of things. Or is light a particle? And you sit there in a class, you're like, well, it's got to be one or the other. And the teacher says, well, it's kind of both. There's like evidence for both of those things. And we don't really have the understanding or the framework or the mathematics to explain that yet. But both of those things seem to be true. And I wonder if there are things in the Bible like that, that when it comes to matters of life and death and eternity and God and mercy and justice, the Bible says, well, A is true and B is true and doesn't sometimes seem particularly concerned about reconciling together, but just asks us to, yeah, to understand both of those things. And that might be enough. But in this case, I think the Bible actually does help us a little bit. The idea is this, what if the reason that the author of this letter and Paul and Jesus speak so plainly about the warnings, but then so confidently about Christians finishing the race is that they know for those who are committed to Jesus, who then hear these warnings, that they will work, that they will respond, that they will say, oh my goodness, I get it. And they will walk back on the path. 
And in fact, how about if these warnings are the mechanism, they're one of the ways by which Jesus will complete what he has started in you. Because you might be drifting, you might be falling off the path, but you are here this morning and you are hearing these warnings and Jesus is working in your hearts through the Holy Spirit to bring you back into line with the plans that he has for you. The clearest example of this comes in a story actually in Acts chapter 27. So the early Christian leader, Paul, is on a boat. He's a prisoner and he's sailing to Rome and he's going to stand trial before Caesar. And he gets to the island of Crete and there is this huge storm. It's called the Northeaster. And, and it goes on for days and for days and they're on the boat and they're trying to you know, throw off the cargo and beat off the winds. And Paul speaks up as a prisoner and he says this. He says, I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Everyone will be saved. Paul is told, by an angel of God. And on the scale of like, not very confident to confident, the fact that it's an angel of God who's told me probably thinks, probably makes me think pretty sure that what I've been told is true. But then a few days later, the winds are still battering the boat and they're throwing cargo and they're trying to tie up ropes to keep the boat together. And Paul sees a group of soldiers who are trying to escape the ship. They're, they're lowering down the lifeboat, pretending to do something else and think, well, maybe if we could get on the lifeboat and sail away, then we'll be safe. And Paul sees what's going on and he says to the centurion, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Do you notice what happens in the space of just a few verses? Paul is first giving absolute assurance that every single person on the ship will be safe. And then in the face of a storm, he says, unless you stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. He's issuing a warning that in some ways feels contradictory to the assurance that he has that they will be saved. But as a result, the centurions cast away the lifeboat, no one gets on it, and everyone on the ship is saved. Paul's assurance is found to be true. And not only that, the warnings are the mechanism by which that assurance comes to pass. And I wonder if there are moments in life when this is working out as well. And that's how we deal with some of these passages, whether there are moments in life when, like those on the ship, we're thinking it might be easier for us to go a different direction. It might be much more convenient. It might feel much safer for us to go on this lifeboat and try and track a course to land. But when, like these soldiers, we are in mortal danger, whether there are decisions that we're making today that will transform not just our lives, but all of eternity. And we think, oh, maybe let's go a different way. Maybe let's not stay the course. Let's not finish this journey. Let's get off and go another direction. But just as we're thinking that, we hear the warning from Paul, unless they stay on the ship, then you cannot be saved. I wonder if the author is pleading with us, like Paul to the centurion, stay on the ship. If you fall away, it's impossible for you to come back. If there is ongoing and deliberate sin, then no sacrifice remains. It might be easier, but please throw off everything that hinders you. Throw off those sins that so easily entangle and stay the course. Run the race, finish the fight. Keep going, run, run with perseverance. The race marked out before you and fix your eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the pioneer of your faith, knowing that he will hold you firm, that he is speaking to you this morning, that he's bringing you close, that he's holding you, calling you back to the path. So friends, let's hear his words today. Let's heed these warnings today. But know this, he will hold you fast. No one can snatch you out of his hands. Place your trust in him and he will finish what he started. Dave, let's sing together. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Hey, don't click off just yet. I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this message. My name is Josh. I'm part of the team here at The Beacon. And if this video has impacted you in any way, why not share it with a friend? 
You know, we exist to help people know God, find freedom, discover their purpose and make a difference. If you go down to the description below, you will find our attachments with all the information that you need. If you'd like to give to support us to the work that we do, then that is the place where you can do that. That's it from me. Have a great day.